What if in Matt Rule's second season in Lincoln and in the inaugural season for the 12-team college football playoff, the Nebraska Cornhuskers earn double-digit wins, they punch through the glass ceiling, and they take up a spot in the 12-team playoff? Some of you may think I am insane for even contemplating this question. Probably most of you watching this video think or feel that way to some degree. And some of you think that probably in an ideal world, I should be drug tested before making this video. But it's not as crazy as you think it is. And an example that I will use to back that up is 2016 Nebraska. They started out 7-0, and and despite playing nobody, which is probably the average caliber of team that Nebraska will play in their first seven games this year, the 2016 Mike Riley squad was ranked inside of the top 10 when they earned their first loss late in October to Wisconsin. This is possible, especially given the caliber of schedule that Nebraska has and also the caliber of staff and players that they do have. But there's a difference between they can do it and they will do it. So let's dive in and figure out that part. Welcome back, college football fanatics. The season is less than 100 days away. And if you want another college football channel to follow, and not just any college football channel, but the best college football channel as it relates to the Big Ten, please like this video so we can get more listeners and go into the algorithm, get ourselves out there, and also hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so that you can join this community. We'll be doing a giveaway at 20,000 subscribers, and the notification bell will allow yourself to be notified when I do that giveaway and notified every time I release a video. Also, comment your thoughts down below. Do you think Nebraska even has a minuscule chance of reaching the playoff? Do you think it's totally out of the question? Let me know down below. And last but certainly not least, please check out my Patreon page and my merchandise store to just see what's up. And if you want to support this channel in an extra mile, those are the ways to do it right now is my Patreon page and my merchandise store via the links in the description and the pinned comment. If you join my Patreon page as a Heisman member after six months, you get signed college football with Sam merch. You get to message me directly as a Heisman member, and I will respond. As an All-American or Heisman member, you get bonus content, and that will release as the regular season comes closer. And as an All-Conference member, like all other members, your name will be shown at the beginning and end of every video with a shout-out at the end. And on my merchandise store, you can buy College Football with Sam shirts that are themed in every Big Ten school's colors, which is pretty cool. I have an Ohio State one, a Michigan one, an Oregon one, and I'm going to try and get more before the regular season hits. Let me know as well if you think I should do YouTube memberships because they do have some things that Patreon doesn't have, and I wonder if it would just be easier for you all to join a YouTube membership rather than traveling to a different website. So let me know that in the comment section below as well, if you have the time. But without further ado, let's dive back in to this question. Because like I said, there's a difference between they can make the playoff versus I believe they will make the playoff. And I think that they can. Let's start there. And the reasoning for that revolves around their schedule, their talent, and despite the fact that the Big Ten abolished divisions, and in theory, that meant the West, or the former teams of the Big Ten West, were going to have a tough time, teams like Nebraska, Iowa, to a certain degree even Minnesota and Northwestern, kind of got off the hook with that. Rutgers from the East, Penn State, and Maryland were other Big Ten teams to benefit on an average strength of schedule basis, at least for this year, compared to their previous seasons. But focusing on the West, Iowa has a very favorable schedule. Nebraska does as well. The college football playoff committee cares about three things, strength of schedule, strength of record, and the eye test. Now, 
We don't always know what the criteria is for the college football playoff, but we have an idea. Nebraska, out of all Big Ten teams, has the 12th toughest Big Ten schedule per ESPN's FPI. The 12th toughest. It's not like Michigan's schedule, where Oregon, Ohio State, and Texas are three top 10 teams, some would say three top four, top five teams that the Wolverines have to play. Not like Michigan's schedule. It's not like Michigan State's, where Ohio State, Michigan, and Oregon are on the Spartans' schedule. It's not like Purdue's schedule. Purdue is the toughest schedule in the Big Ten, 11th per ESPN's FPI. And Purdue plays Notre Dame non-conference and then Oregon, Ohio State, and Penn State. Nebraska's is 12th in the Big Ten, 32nd nationally. And the only team in the top 15 per FPI that they play is Ohio State. And when you factor in the top 30 teams, Colorado, Iowa, and Wisconsin, and in fact, even UCLA are close to that, but none of them are even in the top 30. Only USC is. So there's only two top 30 teams in football power that Nebraska plays all season long. Now, the bad news as it relates to the college football playoff is there's no way that a 9-3 and Nebraska team is reaching the playoff. A 9-3 and Georgia, a 9-3 and Alabama, a 9-3 and Michigan, if this year is full of chaos and every team or maybe all teams but one, two, or three have more than one loss at the end of the year, those three teams and maybe some more could reach the playoff with three losses, depending on how the dice roll. Same with a Pac, not Pac-12, pardon me, that's going to take some adjusting to get used to, Big 12 or ECC schools that get into their conference championship game and win with three losses. It's the same thing with the Big 10 or the SEC. If somehow a three-loss team wins the conference, they'll get an auto bid. Uh, For Nebraska, given their weak strength of schedule, They're probably not going to win any tiebreakers to go to Indy if they have that many losses because, yes, strength of conference schedule is actually a part of the tiebreakers now in large effect, which is just awesome in my mind. Rewards good play, better incentive. It's just more fair. It's something that I like about the new Big Ten. Divisions are abolished. But with Nebraska's schedule, they have to go 10-2 and and preferably 11-1, 12-0, which I've already... discussed in previous videos of mine, and I maintain this opinion, Nebraska's not going 11-1 and or 12-0. and They're not. So they have to achieve at their ceiling to even have a shot at the playoff, which makes their odds already very small. And they can't lose to any non-top 30 teams or non-top 25 teams, in my opinion, which means a loss to Colorado? Absolutely not. Probably can't afford that especially since there are teams like Ohio State, USC, Wisconsin, Iowa, and depending on whether you're with me or not on this, even Rutgers, probably will be better than the Buffaloes this season. Can't lose to a team like Colorado, can't lose to Illinois, Purdue, can't lose to Indiana before the Ohio State game, so they have to stay on top of all games, even trap games. Losing to Rutgers at home would not be preferable. And losing later in the season hurts. It's better to lose early than later, which stinks because since all the tough games are later in the season and you don't want to lose to small teams, for with Nebraska's weak schedule, that kind of demands perfection outside of the Ohio State game and maybe the USC game. And then there's the eye test as well. The committee loves teams who play in either elite conferences, which check, Nebraska checks that box, or teams that are dominant, and or teams that are dominant. So Nebraska must win big. And that's just not their play style. I remember Matt Rule at Baylor in 2019, third year, great Baylor team, going to overtime with a bad TCU team and playing several other close games. It was the same way at Temple, same way in his earlier seasons at Baylor, and it's the same way last year with Nebraska. They had several close wins, several close losses, I don't think this team is going to be blowing out people under Matt Rule, period, especially in year two. They come across as more of a game control type team, and the committee 
the committee will fall. I mean, this is the reason why, for example, Ohio State in 21 and 22 was viewed as much better than Michigan, even when in retrospect they weren't, is because Ohio State's style of play gets more clicks, it catches your attention more. I've even fallen for it. That style of play is just more exciting. The committee loves exciting teams. Nebraska, especially this season, doesn't come across as a team that will be exciting. They have exciting aspects, but in terms of dominance, blowing people out, and just being a great team, that's unlikely. So out of all the boxes to check, strength of schedule, strength of record, potential for quality wins, the eye test, playing in a tough conference, Nebraska doesn't check many of those boxes. But let's dive even deeper and specifically look at the schedule. Because FPI believes that this is an easy schedule relative to the average Big Ten team. But reaching the college football playoff is hard, especially with the brutal November slate, like USC, Wisconsin, Iowa. Yes, technically UCLA is in November, but it's November 2nd. There's a buy after. What I'm really talking about is USC, Wisconsin, Iowa, with two of those games being on the road. And the one game that's at home, Wisconsin, is a team that I think matches up rather well with the Cornhuskers. But we'll get into that later. It mainly has to do with Nebraska's secondary having some questions, with especially the deep ball, and Wisconsin probably having the best passing offense outside of maybe Nebraska, but I'd strongly lean Wisconsin right now out of all the former Big Ten West teams. Losses in November, which this ties in with the brutal November slate, losses in November, assuming that Ohio State's an auto loss, which I'm going to say it's close to, if not, an auto loss. At best, it's 99% a loss. Losses in November or to mediocre teams kill any shot of reaching the playoff. Again, Colorado, Rutgers, Iowa, I would say just with their offense and the fact that they probably won't be that much better on on that side of the ball, and Iowa being the final game of the season, ending your season on a loss, especially with the college football playoff committee taking recency bias into account, not good. I mean, look at 2017 Wisconsin. They go 12-0, and losing a close game against an Ohio State team that was probably better than their record indicated, got booted out in favor for Alabama, who lost to—they had the worst loss, but they had the better strength of schedule. Look at Michigan State in 2021. Despite them beating Michigan head-to-head, Michigan was ranked ahead of the Spartans before the Spartans got blown up by Ohio State. Why was that? Michigan State— had the worst loss, they had similar strength of schedules, and Michigan looked more dominant. So really, that's that also recency bias again. Michigan State had the more recent loss compared to Michigan. So all of these things really tied in with the weak strength of schedule don't help Nebraska's case. But Nebraska's goal anyway this season is just to go bowling. It's good to theorize about what they would need to do to get in, and I'm theorizing about it because, again, a team like Colorado could reach the playoff. Rutgers and Iowa, with their schedule, could reach the playoff. They could. Look at Iowa's schedule. Ohio State's the auto loss. They could go 11-1. and If they play Ohio State somewhat respectably for a half, they'll probably make the 12-team playoff even with them being Iowa. If Rutgers goes 11-1 and and their loss is at Nebraska, at Virginia Tech, and maybe Virginia Tech wins the ACC or at USC, and USC is a top 25 team, they would probably make the 12-team playoff. Expanding the playoff field, you take four teams and you add another eight to the equation, and only one of them is going to be a non-Power 4 school, most likely, you're nearly increasing your field of teams that will make the playoff from the Power 4 by 200%, if, if I'm doing the math in my head correctly, by nearly 200%. Not exactly because that group of five auto bid, but nearly that number. You're going to get teams, 
and this is one of the issues with the 12-team playoff, is the 11th best team who will be power four versus the best team who will be power four. The difference between those teams will be multiple touchdowns. You are going to get teams in the playoff that you would never pencil in to reach the four-team playoff from last year if you put them in last year's final college football playoff rankings. But because of the mass expansion, there's an opportunity for teams that are even viewed as mediocre in the preseason or even bad to enter the playoff without having to go on a total Cinderella run. TCU, for example, could have lost a game or two in 2022 and still made the 12-team playoff if they won the Big 12 championship game instead. Just as an example, if Colorado wins the Big 12, they're in. If Rutgers and Iowa win double-digit games, more preferably they go 11-1, and which I think is possible because they have easier schedules, I think, than Nebraska does, then they're in, most likely. The goal is to go bowling. But I'm mainly doing this video, if you can't tell already, for the fun of it, and because I think it's possible. Not because it's likely, I'm not even predicting it, but it's possible. Uh, this schedule, it's one that provides an opportunity to build momentum, to solve issues, and to play in a top 10 matchup against Ohio State. And potentially, if everything goes right for Nebraska, they can for sure be in that playoff conversation, especially if other teams are losing, they're walking with two left feet, tripping over themselves, and Nebraska is controlling games and finding ways to win. I mean, remember, Alabama made the playoffs last year. That team, all they did was manage games. That's all they did. There was not a single impressive win that they had outside of their game against Georgia. And I'd argue their most impressive game of the year was either that game in the SEC title or playing Michigan as close as they did despite Michigan obviously being the better team in the Rose Bowl. Alabama, 12-1. and They had Nick Saban, a lot more talent than Nebraska. I'm not comparing those two teams. What I'm saying is if Alabama made the four-team playoff without being dominant, having an ugly loss— against Texas, an ugly loss at home, then Nebraska can probably contend for the 12-team playoff with a much easier schedule to balance out for the talent disparity and head coaching disparity. And again, eight extra teams can come in, seven extra power four teams. And with the schedule and also the team that Nebraska has, it's doable. They have a defensive line that's one of the strongest units in the Big Ten, Returning Nash Huttmacher, who had a breakout season, multiple sacks, more than five sacks. The receiver core is good. Jalen Lloyd, Malachi Coleman were young last year, each had a touchdown catch. They had over 100 yards receiving. Isaiah Nayer transfers in. He had a 1,000-yard season at Wyoming in 2021. Was injured at Texas for 22, played sparingly last season. He should be good. Jamal Banks was impressive, honorable mention, all ACC at Wake Forest. Fedoni had multiple touchdown receptions and I think led the team in receiving yards last year. Nebraska has weapons. They do. They have big bodies, the polar bear on the defensive line in Nash Huttmacher. They have speedy receivers, effective receivers, a big body in Fedoni, and at running back, quarterback, they have players there, too, to control the clock. And by quarterback, I'm not just meaning Raiola, who's been accurate at high school, doesn't throw picks, looked good in the spring game. You have Heinrich Harburg, who can run the ball, who can bully opposing defenders, who's the perfect quarterback to QB sneak on fourth and one, third and one, or maybe do a quarterback power on third or fourth and short. And at running back, Dante Dowdle, Gabe Irvin Jr., Emmett Johnson, all have power back capability, and Ramir Johnson, training at wide receiver at times, good route runner, fast. You have him as well. Very deep running back room, potential to have a deep and impressive quarterback room, to be good on one side of the trenches on the defensive line. That's great. 
and to have receivers who can make life easier on the quarterback, make the offense less one-dimensional, which it was very one-dimensional last year, that is helpful as well. And you can include the secondary too, with Malcolm Hartzog coming back, with Tommy Hill, who should be one of the better corners in the Big Ten. He's returning. A Bly Hill, if healthy, he's going to be an impact transfer. There are a lot of strong points on this team. So while I'm not telling you to predict Nebraska to reach the playoff, I, I, it just I need to for, to hammer that message home. What I am telling you is, don't be surprised when or if this team is good, and don't be shocked when the college football playoff committee is potentially, A, fooled by the easy start that Nebraska has, and they rank them top 15 or top 10 to begin the year, or B, Nebraska starts off strong, but they also finish strong, and they're maybe in that playoff conversation at the end of the year. Nebraska has plenty of strengths, but like I mentioned earlier, I don't think they're going 11-1. and I certainly don't think they're going 12-0. and This team still has a ways to go. I'm very high on Dylan Raiola, for example, but he hasn't recorded a single collegiate snap. He is the ceiling of Trevor Lawrence, potentially being a generational prospect, but he could be Nebraska's Blake Barnett. There, there was a reason that Saban started Blake Barnett against USC in 2016. There was a reason for that. There was a reason why Tate Forcier at Michigan was started by Rich Rodriguez, and they flamed out. Highly talented players that were predicted to do big things based off of minimal exposure or no exposure at all, and they flamed out. You just never know. Having that big of a question, especially given that Heinrich Harburg's limitations are somewhat known, and Kalen is young and more limited than Raiola, the quarterback position, especially for Nebraska, is critical. That's also especially the case because of the offensive line. If Nebraska had a 2022 Ohio State, Michigan, or Georgia caliber offensive line, they could roll with Harburg and potentially have an even higher ceiling than they do this year without Raiola being in the picture. And I'm dead serious when I say that, because having a Joe Moore Award caliber offensive line, well, you might as well have the potential to have the key to win the Big Ten Conference, which specializes in trench play, especially on the interior of the O-line or the D-line. Nebraska, I think, has that figured out on the D-line. But on the O-line, I don't know. I think that Ben Scott at center, respectable player, good player, one of the better centers in the Big Ten, and they also have Micah Mezcua, Bryce Benhart. Those are just some players to look out for. But they don't have anyone who strikes as first, or in my opinion, even second team, all Big Ten. Maybe Mezcua, but again, incoming transfer, and he wasn't an All-American at Florida. Very good, but just one player. The O-line is a whole unit. Five players, and I'd say closer to 10 than five because how many injuries an offensive line will sustain in a given season. It's just the facts. The offensive line has to get better. Nebraska, at one point, led the Big Ten in rushing last year. And that was because that's all they did. All they did was run the football. It wasn't because they were elite or great at running the ball. Ohio State at points last year was better at running the ball than Nebraska because of Travion Henderson. But they wanted to have a more balanced attack, and they passed a lot more than Nebraska did. So the Cornhuskers I know this year are going to pass more than they are going to run. And with a new quarterback, it's imperative that if this team wants to be in the conversation that I'm talking about, or even just solidify going to a bowl game. And I'd say for Nebraska, they should shoot higher than going to a bowl game. Not going to the playoff, that'd be ridiculous, but earning a winning record. Not just going 6-6, six and six, but go 7-5 and five or 8-4. and four. That should be a goal of this team. And if they want to do that, especially with, again, their schedule is not hard, but I wouldn't say it's easy either relative to all other college football schedules, 
they're going to have to be good in the trenches. That includes the offensive line and not just Nash Hutmacher and the defensive line. And the defense, while I think they will be good, if they're not elite, Colorado, Ohio State, USC, and Wisconsin, all teams with good to great wide receiver rooms, and I would say good to great quarterbacks. Heck, in case of Ohio State and USC, round the wide receiver positions to elite. Same with USC's QB. If the secondary yet again has some of the struggles that they did last year defending the deep ball, and if the linebacker core isn't set because both God, Luke Henrich and Luke Reimer, Luke Reimer and Nick Henrich, pardon me, nearly mixed up their names, they're both gone. If that position isn't figured out and the secondary still has some of their issues, even with health reasons, I know that Bly Hill, I don't know how his injury report's tracking right now, but if things go wrong on that defense, look for those four teams to potentially have their way, and Iowa, add them up there as well. They won't slice and dice that defense, but they would eventually physically wear down the Huskers in what looks to be a night game for the Heroes Trophy. So can this team make the college football playoff? Well, yes, but it's very unlikely. FPI only gives Nebraska a 4.9% chance to make the college football playoff. And I think Nebraska's ceiling is 10-2. and And I've said that in my previous Top 25 video where I had Nebraska at 14th. Now, if you're a Top 15 team, you're a playoff contender. I think Nebraska is close to a playoff contender, but also my rankings are more so power rankings, not me only ranking teams based off of their strength of record, for example. It's also power rankings and how good of a team they are relative to others. This is a down year in football. That's why I think this Nebraska team is going to be top 15. Uh, this Nebraska team, what I think they'll be this year in last year's final rankings or in last year's power rankings, would probably be just top 20 or maybe just inside the top 25. I think last year was a pretty strong year. This year, I think, is going to be a pretty weak year. There's less returning production, I think, across the board for the great teams, and the quarterback position is going to be weak with the majority of top 10 quarterbacks from last year, whether by NFL potential or by quarterback efficiency, they're gone, off to the NFL. So those are some reasons why I think that's the case. It presents a unique opportunity for the Huskers, but 10-2 and two with that schedule is not a guarantee to get in though it would give Nebraska, I think, a more than likely chance to get in, but that's their ceiling. 9-3 and three and 8-4 and four is probably more likely than 10-2, and two, especially 9-3. and three. I think that they are better than everyone on their schedule, minus Ohio State. I, I think they'll, they're, they're better than Wisconsin, Ohio State, not Ohio State, duh, Iowa, and USC, and certainly Colorado, and even Rutgers, who I'm very high on. But due to the fact that this team still has some kinks to work out and they're not as deep as Matt Rule wants them to be, there will be upsets, whether it's against teams that match up well with them, like Colorado, USC, Wisconsin, and, well, duh, Ohio State. Again, that's probably an auto loss. It's the only team on Nebraska's schedule who I think is better than Nebraska, but Ohio State is miles ahead of Nebraska. And it's a game on the road. I'm just for example. Um, or it could be Iowa, or maybe Purdue, or maybe Rutgers. I mean, we just don't know. Nebraska has not played at the level I think they'll play at this year in more than a decade since the Polini era. Rule is not finished building his program, and this team is not deep enough to go 11-1 and or even win a college football playoff game if they happen to make it. But I think this team is bound to take a step forward this year. You all know that I am high on them, and there, there's a chance. Not saying it's guaranteed. I don't think it'll happen, but there's a chance, which we couldn't say, I'd say, for the past decade. Thank you all for watching this video. Please remember to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and comment your thoughts down below. Thanks to Crash2488 and Brasco Rascal for being Heisman patrons. 
Thanks to Chris Lane and Connor Little OH for being All American patrons. And thanks to John Lynn, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Austin Christmas, and Janisha Cockrell for being All Conference patrons. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you all very soon. Bye bye.